Bioneers, Revolution from the Heart of Nature is made possible in part by Organic Valley, a farmer-owned cooperative producing local food with the future in mind since 1988. Learn more at OrganicValley.com. Welcome to the Bioneers, Revolution from the Heart of Nature. The Titanic that's going down right now is not going to hit iceberg because there won't be any left. And the game, as far as I can tell, is about finding your lifeboat. And as far as I've been able to figure out, the lifeboat you're looking for is called your watershed. And it's going to be watershed by watershed by watershed by watershed in a decentralized, resilient, community-based, bioregionally engaged, three-dimensional, hydrologically, geologically inspired space, whereupon every human land use that occurs from stem to stern, from ridgeline to river mouth, is up for the grand, resilient retrofit. It's all alive. It's all connected. It's all intelligent. It's all relatives. We stand at the threshold of a historic opportunity in the human experiment to reimagine how to live on Earth in ways that honor the web of life, each other, and future generations. It's a revolution from the heart of nature and the human heart. In this series, The Bioneers, Revolution from the Heart of Nature, we celebrate social and scientific innovators with breakthrough solutions for restoring people and planet, creating a future environment of hope. You may think we're all living on planet Earth. But ever since our first awestruck glimpse from space of our shimmering blue marble, that iconic 1972 image taken by the crew of the Apollo 17 moon mission, it's been plain to see that this is actually planet water. Water is at the source of every human endeavor, from our bodies themselves to industry, agriculture, energy production, and waste management. Water is life. Yet half of Americans can't name one component of the vital water cycle upon which all life depends. And precious few folks have ever heard about the regenerative design revolution called permaculture. Permaculture is a bold global vision that leaps beyond sustainability to the permanent self-renewing restoration of living systems. Permaculture design principles and practices present elegant solutions to climate change, And it's a way of life that respects the wholeness of ecosystems and builds social and ecological resiliency. Join master permaculture designers Darren J. Doherty and Brock Dolman for practical and poetic pathways to re-educate us earthlings in water and soil literacy to live on Earth for the long haul. This is Re-Inhabit, Rehydrate, Regenerate, Permaculture Designs for an Enduring Planet. My name is Neil Harvey. I'll be your host. Welcome to the Bioneers, revolution from the heart of nature. As a biologist, I spent enough time trying to figure out endangered species and critters, and it became clear to me that when the water cycle was compromised, the capacity to support life was going to be compromised. And so I've Mostly spent a lot of time studying water, not that I've abandoned the snakes and frogs and turtles and lizards and scorpions and such, but trying to figure out that basic cycle of life. And when you talk water, you get to talk about everything. Brock Dolman is a renowned permaculture teacher, natural historian, master birder, and the director of the Occidental Arts and Ecology Center's Water Institute. He has fashioned the concept of the Basins of Relations, to help people organize communities around the common landscape, politics, culture, and economy of their watersheds. Basically, the water cycle and the life cycle are the same cycle. No water, no life. We live on this amazing planet, and every human endeavor, you can unpack it and look at it. There's water at the base of supporting that system, all manufacturing and all food production, all waste, all energy. It's all there. Water's at the root of that. And Luna Leopold, the son of Aldo Leopold, has this wonderful quote I like a lot, that the health of our waters is the principal measure of how we live on the land. So if you would like to judge the efficacy of your settlement pattern in place through time, why don't you evaluate the quantity and quality of the water in your stream, in your lake, in your estuary, in your bay, or in your ocean? Seventy percent of this planet is covered by water. 
volumetrically, 97% is the ocean, 2% poles and caps, and 1% is fresh water cycling annually. Dolman says that in the post-industrial era, we've polluted half of all fresh water on the planet. Climate change is exacerbating the already severe stresses on water resources coming from population growth, urbanization, and economic pressures. Access to fresh, clean water for all is already becoming a key political issue of our time. For example, one-sixth of the world's population depends on meltwater from the glaciers of the Himalayas. As warming temperatures cause the decline of high mountain snow cover and glacier melt accelerates, well over a billion people will find themselves high and dry. Everywhere you look, the water cycle is destabilizing. 80% of California's water supply is delivered to us as a solid that stays high and leaks out slowly called Sierra Snowpack. 75 to 100 years we're due to have many possible winters that have zero or less than 10% snowpack, 80% of the water supply of the state. And all that's moving to that mean sea level rise. And so what we're going to get, as far as I can tell, is a lot of affordable housing, (laughs) right? That housing you have to ford through the water to get to, is that affordable anymore? (laughs) Right? Is that what it looks like? And so at this point, you're all like, dude, I came here to be inspired. What do you like bumming me out? Well, the Titanic that's going down right now is not going to hit iceberg because there won't be any left. And the game, as far as I can tell, is about finding your lifeboat and figuring out what your lifeboat is. And as far as I've been able to figure out, the lifeboat you're looking for is called your watershed. All right? And it's going to be watershed by watershed by watershed by watershed in a decentralized, resilient, community-based, bioregionally engaged, three-dimensional, hydrologically, geologically inspired space whereupon every human land use that occurs from stem to stern, from ridgeline to river mouth, is up for the grand, resilient retrofit. Every human land use from forestry and grazing and agriculture and urbanization and industrial systems and suburbs and rural residential, every human land use, remember, it's about water is the principal measure of how we live on the land, and we've got to outfit every lifeboat. And it's going to be lifeboats across the world because everyone on the planet lives in a watershed. So this isn't a NIMBY thing. It's like, well, it's not my watershed, not my lifeboat. You've got to step up to the plate and deal. And so we're enrolling a whole new Navy of lifeboat captains and crew out there. (laughs) And we would like the pioneers to step up. All right. I would support you that you inquire within. (laughs) Are you capable as a deckhand to batten down the hatches and in this global peak weirding moment step up and retrofit the way in which your lifeboat will behave in the extremities of the weirding. We got 6 to 12 inches in a mid-October rainfall here a couple days ago. Unheard of. I was really happy at OAC. As I was laying in bed there and it was raining like crazy, I'm just thinking, oh, my pond's filling up and a mile of swales are filling up and the water bars are working and my roof water tanks are filling up. And I'm, if Guy is going to give me an allowance into my water budget, I'm happy to open up the deposit slip and take that early allowance because we're patterning the landscape to be absorptive and receptive and receiving of this offering. Ponds, swales, water bars and roof water tanks are elements of the permaculture design strategy that Brock Dolman teaches around the world. They're all ways we can catch, save, channel, and store the most precious resource of all, water. Dolman explains the concept of basins of relations as he describes one species teetering on the brink. When salmon are healthy, the whole watershed thrives, everything from the ocean to the headwaters, including us humans. You look at an indicator species like this where here you've got a fish that has a life cycle where it's born in fresh water, it goes to salt water, it comes back to fresh water in this life cycle called anadromy. And the little fish are in the fresh water, but there's not much food in the fresh water. It's a nursery to the creeks, the headwaters. Then they go to the ocean, they get really fat. Imagine, you know, king salmon, 
50, 60 pounders or something. And, and then they swim back and famously leap and jump and do all that amazing stuff. And then they spawn with each other and then they die. And in that death is the return of life because what they've done is they've gone to the ocean and they've reclaimed the minerals and the nutrients that have been eroded from the land and then were through the evaporation process remain, which is why the oceans are salty, in their body through the biomagnification of eating various little fish and things, they bring back up calcium, phosphorus, nitrogen, potassium, all the, the NPK, the micronutrients. And what scientists have found is you could sample a baby steelhead in a stream in Oregon and find that 60% of the nitrogen in the body of this fish is of marine origin, i.e. it's been eating insects that ate on the carcass of its dead parents or you know other salmon in that system 50 percent of the calcium in a grizzly bear bone from a museum in yellowstone from 100 years ago the calcium was of marine origin and that bears 1500 miles from the coast so you see that the return of salmonids in the pacific northwest in many cases in a historic intact watershed system was returning in some cases fully half of the basic food nutrient chemical food that drove the processes of the forest, vegetation, animal, human, bear, otter, eagle, coon, critter system, right? And so salmonid extinction is really a starvation issue for watersheds, and fish live in water. And so what we're seeing is with things such as land use that dumps a lot of sediment in creeks or other pollutants in creeks or wastewater with endocrine-disrupting compounds that feminize fish or make them hermaphroditic or putting dams across the creek so the fish can no longer get home. They're, you know, their clarion call as canaries in the watershed coal mine give us a sense that, geez, 150 years ago, even 100 years ago, in fact, some cases in where I live in Sonoma County, 60 years ago, the fish were so thick you could walk on their backs. And we've seen coho salmon in the Russian River Basin go from 60,000 individuals in the 50s and 60s to in the last five or six years working very hard with a number of biologists, Department of Fish and Game folks. They've been lucky to find 10 or 12 individual fish. So it, it for the introspective bipedal sac of saline solution who is able to mitigate their cerebral imperviousness and get it through their hard-headedness that the most important place to start is in the headwaters, which is in the water in your own head, and understand these clues are, they're not, they're not chicken little and viros telling you that, oh, whatever, the fish are dying. There's something else going on here, and we've done that. We've only inhabited these watersheds for 50, 100 years, whereas the native people in many of these cases were there for 500 generations, right, 10,000 years. So... You can't just slough it off. We need a collective 12-step program that says, hi, my name is Brock, and I'm responsible for water degradation. And then let's stop blaming each other, and let's move on to how we can regain our regenerative relationship that's reciprocal and reverential. Brock Dolman uses the concept of watersheds to help us understand what a regenerative relationship to the land might look like. Like salmon, human beings are a keystone species, Many other species depend on how we live. Permaculture shows us how we can live here in a way that lasts, by being a blessing on the land. Australian permaculturist Darren Doherty has committed his life to growing soil. That's his response to restoring healthy waters and performing the intricate planetary balancing act. When we return, Doherty digs into the power of soil. This is Re-Inhabit, Rehydrate, Regenerate, Permaculture Designs for an Enduring Planet. I'm Neil Harvey. You're listening to The Bioneers, Revolution from the Heart of Nature. You can download this and other programs on the radio pages at Bioneers.org. As a civilization, we've been treating our soil like dirt. 
Master permaculturist Darren Doherty says it's time to quit our degenerative agricultural practices and engage in a completely new kind of farming, where the most important crop is abundant, healthy soil. Well, I choose to not use the word agricultural because it's no longer agricultural because agriculture to me denotes um, something that's actually a degenerative activity as opposed to permaculture, which is a, by nature a, not a sustainable activity. It's, a, it's beyond sustainability. It's a regenerative activity. The ethic of farming should be that um, we produce food and fibre and as a residue of that we increase the amount of soil that we have and that the water that passes through our landscape gets cleaner as, as, as a result of leaving it, well, as it goes through it. You know, the goal is, at first, to be a solar economist and to make soil your first crop. If you farm so that soil is your first crop, well, then everything else will come from that, surely. Permaculture operates in sharp contrast to industrial agriculture, which relies on oil, monocultural crops, and petroleum-based fertilizers and chemicals, all of which deplete soil, pollute land and water, and harm human environmental health. Permaculture works from how nature designs, with a food web of nutrients and symbiotic relationships among highly diverse plants, animals, and organisms, all operating over very different individual life cycles and time frames. For the communities and the systems themselves to operate appropriately, regenerate, etc., they have to have multiple species in them. And there has to be the capacity to produce short-term, medium-term and long-term crops of many different kinds. So you've got the canopy species, then you've got the sub-canopy, and then you've got the smaller tree layer, and then you've got the root layer, the mulch layer, the climbing layer, the shrub layer, etc. Right? So there's seven different layers in a in a forest. For example, the world may face a global chocolate shortage because industrialized cocoa plantation agriculture has so severely damaged the lands where cocoa grows. In response, the M&M Mars Company approached Darren Doherty to design a mixed species landscape using nature's blueprint. Mars, of course, still sought good crop yields, but wanted to experiment with an agroforestry system that would actually enrich the local ecology. The trees were mostly timber trees of high value and also those that produce um, medicinal outcomes. We had some stuff called aquilaria in there, we called the um, eagle wood, and it produces an essential oil in association with a fungus that infects it over time. And We had uh, lychees in there, um, we had some citru- a few different types of citrus in there down in the sort of cacao story, and then we had bananas in there as a, as a short-term mulch crop. We had peanuts in there at the start because, you know, you start a system at ground zero, you've got lots of light coming in until the trees grow. So we had corn or maize and we had um, peanuts and we had bananas and cassava and all of those sorts of what you might call temporary crops because once the shade comes in, you know, they just can't perform. So And lots of other leguminous shrubs and stuff mm-hmm. that were part of that pioneering process. So... Yeah, it's, and it's still emerging. I mean, you know, these things, you don't grow a forest overnight. It'll, it'll you know, and it's a 20-year project. Another successful permaculture design builds healthy soils by capturing water and then directing and slowing its movement through the landscape. Slow water to make slow food. Called key line design, the practice originated from mining geologists and organic farmers dealing with Australia's highly variable rainfall and dangerously accelerating soil loss. And it's very rawest. It's just a soil building methodology. You know, the soil is the place where we hold the most water that's available. So, um, you know, turning your soil into a reservoir. You build dams, ponds, um, but you put them in places where you can use the gravity water supply from them for flood irrigation or for piped irrigation, etc. So it uses the topography in a framework to... Or you take advantage of the topography, harvest the water from it, keep the water in the landscape for longer. The dams are interconnected, so one overflows to the other and to the other and to the other, and then they cascade across a foothills landscape and um, you have trees that are integrated in on those landscape patterns, so you have alleys of pasture and alleys of tree belts, of hedgerows, and it's a, it's a pretty harmonious 
very, very highly functioning landscape um, and you know, ultimately very high production and drought proof. It's a regenerative permanent agriculture. Yeah, it's a, it's a sweet system. A nature-based design system that relies solely on available sunlight, gravity, surface water, and rain. Nested within a symbiotic diversity of plants and animals, an elegant system for the successful human re-inhabitation of planet water. Darren Doherty correctly asserts that healthy, resilient soil will greatly help mitigate climate change. He points out that there's more carbon in soil than there is in all plant life and the atmosphere combined. He says the fastest way to reduce atmospheric carbon is to sequester it in the world's soils. And he knows how. Just ask nature. We need to use photosynthesis as our tool to restore that carbon to where it's mostly come from, which is the soil, right? And the fastest way to do that is to establish in the temperate zone at least and in the dryland zone perennial grasslands because perennial grasses are the most efficient carbon plants on the planet. Now, perennial grass can live for 500 years, but no one treats grasses, particularly perennial native grasses, with any reverence at all or any respect for how efficient they are. I mean, the legacy that your prairies and other prairie landscapes around the planet have, have left agriculture is enormous. You know, the reason why you've got such beautiful deep soils in your prairies is not because they were forested, it was because they were in perennial grassland. So grasses have that capacity, and the interesting thing is that they have to operate in conjunction with herbivores and herded herbivores and lots of them right so that's the big shift because most of us are being told you know time and all the other magazines greenpeace everybody's saying we've got to stop eating meat and i absolutely agree we've got to stop eating as much meat as we do one two is that we need to stop confinement agriculture it's just insane it just has no energy honesty at all right so we've actually got to move to beyond organic grass-fed landscapes and the food that's produced on them has got to be distributed locally right so that's my big vision for and a lot of um, it's not just me it's the holistic management movement which is working on nearly 40 million acres across the planet and they're the only people that i know of who are doing the most efficient work at building carbon back into soils and restoring ecosystems with the minimum amount of input and the maximum output in terms of production of product and in terms of the ultimate goal of producing soil and producing clean water. So clean water, clean soil. Hooved animals co-evolved with perennial grasslands. They co-created a healthy long-term ecosystem. Holistic rangeland management today is restoring the landscape by restoring those relationships. Using methods like this, the growing global permaculture movement says the grand resilient retrofit can help cool our feverish planet. Alan Yeomans also did a table of um, what would be the carbon, soil carbon building bill for every country across the planet. He calls it 299. And he um, calculated, like, the US and the EU. The EU, in the last 50 years, has been responsible for 37% of the carbon emissions on this planet. The US, I think, was about 32%. So he looked at it as a post-war industrial agriculture era bill. And the US, would only have to, to pay for that bill, would only have to increase its soil carbon by about 5% because you have so much agricultural land to sequester it in. Now, can you imagine the quality of water, all of the ecosystem services that would be performed if on this country we improved the soil, organic carbon, we built 12 inches of soil and that it had you know, levels of up to 8 plus percent organic carbon? When I mean, that's a carbon filter, you don't need a carbon filter at your sink anymore because the water that hits your landscape is being filtered by the carbon mass in your soil. You know, there's 20-odd ecosystem services that are performed by topsoil. 
and we know of at least 40 different methods that rapidly accelerate topsoil formation. So that should be a national effort. That would be an interesting farm bill. But that's up to humans. I think it's up to the market. Once the market sees some of the figures and sees people's support, it will shift. It has to because that's how the market works. So I have a lot of faith in that model. But people have got to be informed, got to stop and listen and think and most importantly think about what they put in their mouth and make those decisions and then uh, then we can move along with it very, very, very quickly because the market will change very, very quickly as it already has. Let's just hope it's not bastardised along the process. Anyway, we'll do our best. It's all we can do. Darren J. Doherty and Brock Dolman Master permaculture designers regenerating soils and watersheds so that once again people can be a blessing on the land, on planet water. Re inhabit, rehydrate, regenerate. Permaculture designs for an enduring planet. Downloads of this program and many other Bioneers radio shows are available on the radio pages at Bioneers.org or by calling one 877 Bioneer. That's one 246 6337 Visit Bioneers.org where you can learn how to attend the annual October Bioneers National Conference and local beaming Bioneers conferences. Purchase the radio series, conference CDs and DVDs, and Bioneers books. Join the thriving online Bioneers community and become a Bioneers member or make a donation. All at Bioneers.org or by calling 1-877-BIONEER. The Bioneers Revolution from the Heart of Nature is a production of Collective Heritage Institute. Executive producer, Kenny Ausubel. Written by Catherine Stifter and Kenny Ausubel. Senior producer, Neil Harvey. Managing producer, Stephanie Welch. Production management, Aaron Leventman and Chuck Castleberry. Station relations by Creative PR. Distribution is by WFMT Radio Network. Original recordings provided by Focus Audio Visual. Interview recording engineer, Jeff Westman. Our theme music is taken from the album Journey Between by Baca Beyond and used by permission of Hannibal Records, a Ryko Disc label. Additional music was made available by Samasati Music at www.samasati.com. For more music information, please visit Bioneers.org. The opinions expressed in the Bioneers Revolution from the Heart of Nature radio series are those of the presenters and are not necessarily those of Collective Heritage Institute, the underwriters, or this radio station. My name is Neil Harvey. Thank you for listening. I invite you to join the Bioneers in inspiring a shift to live on Earth in ways that honor the web of life, each other, and future generations. This is program number 0810. Bioneers Revolution from the Heart of Nature is made possible in part by Organic Valley, a farmer-owned cooperative producing local food with the future in mind since 1988. Learn more at organicvalley.com.